Today we're talking to Dr James Duggan, a research fellow in the Education and Social Research Institute at Manchester Met. We'll be talking to James about the big issues surrounding his subject at the moment and how his research relates to ways in which we can aim to tackle those challenges. So James, just to kick things off, um, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your research interest? Okay, hi, my name is James Duggan um, and uh, my research interests really are in uh, creative and co-produced methods. Um, I'm really interested in, in providing um, young people and communities that I work with interesting you know, prompts and provocations and encounters that helps think about their lives in interesting ways um, and, and move them towards kind of like, you know, the types of lives they, they'd like to be living. Um, my research at the moment mainly focuses on uh, youth loneliness, um, you know, mental health and isolation. So have there been any personal experiences that have made you get into this field or this subject? And for me, it wasn't really, um, you know, a defining moment, really. I think um, what I just have, a, you know, a, a continual idea that things could be slightly better. You know, when you read the newspaper, when you watch TV, when you're on Twitter, you just think, the light, you know, the world is not working how it should be. People who are, you know, should be included aren't being in, um, included. Um, and I think that's what um, my academic interests are really I've, I've worked across a number of areas uh, mental health disability you know education you know young people and what we find out far too late in many areas is that if you actually speak to the people um, who are involved in a situation if you're talking about people's lives you need that perspective their kind of forms of expertise and information and you need their you know you need them to be involved if, you, if you're going to kind of try and improve things um, and so that's um, sort of, you know, my, my interest is just that really. It's, I'm not as interested in um, the, the, the specific topic. You know, I'm, you know, I could spend the rest of my career looking at youth loneliness or it could be something else. I think for me, it's, you know, how do we create um, ways of people having power in their lives? Um, and also, I think, you know, there are lots of ways that we can have a voice, you know, and there are lots of ways that um, people can be listened to. But, but what tends to happen is that the, the roots into kind of these conversations are created in ways that um, marginalize and kind of like minimize people's voice. And I think that's really important, you know, whether it's sort of, you know, tweet into this program or whether it's, you know, filling this questionnaire or whether it's, you know, um, engage with this consultation. These things aren't genuinely empowering. They're not kind of ways that people can transform their lives and communities. And I think for me, it's about thinking carefully um, and, you know, considering the different options, the different histories of these processes and create genuine ways that people can kind of, you know, um, have a say, come together and change their communities and their lives. Yeah, so in the projects that you've either led or been a part of in the past, it tends to be a theme where the participants in the study are involved in actually defining what they want to get out of the study mm -hmm. from the outset rather than you going in and saying here's my hypotheses we need to work, work towards those it's very collaborative throughout so yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about that like the thought process behind that approach and the results that you found that that's provided in the past okay so um yeah my my approach really is to um work with um people in in ways that open up um, new horizons for them. I think what tends to happen when people work in, in co-produced or participatory ways, there's um, a, usually an imbalance between, you know, expertise and knowledge and status. And so one way people kind of go around that is to say that we're, we're equal. Um, and if you're in that kind of like, you know, um, more disadvantaged position, if you're young, if I'm working with a young person, if I'm working with someone, you know, without a PhD, then I should kind of like, you know, defer to their life experience. And I think for me, that um, the, there's, a, there's a merit to that. It's, you know, it's good to kind of like, you know, start where people are. But I also think, you know, it's important not to be really um, scared of, of, of learning from one another. Um, I, I'll learn from them, but that also means they can learn from me. You know, I, I, as an academic, I think I know things, you know, I, you know I, I do work, I've worked in different contexts. So I think what I'm interested in is creating ways that for me and for the, the people I'm working with, we, we think in a, in a slightly different way. Um, one project I did with the, the Brixton Pound, which is a local currency community, is that we used, um, you know, design fiction, which is a, a form of, you know, speculative practice. In, instead of saying, like, how is your life? Um, we said, you know, can we tell stories about how our lives could be? Um, and so we work with this local currency community, basically a, a currency that makes its own community, the, the Brixton Pound. 
and we said you know you've done this in terms of um uh, in terms of you know money what if we did this in terms of tax and you know, that's an example um where you know most people don't think that's research you know if you make something up um it's not true you know it's not it's not evidence-based but what we do really is kind of like create you know um, an opportunity really to say you know i'm an academic you can actually make things up we can talk about what how we'd like our lives to be it doesn't always have to be about the here and now it doesn't have to be the actual and the factual it can be you know made up and i think that's quite liberating because again you know a lot of what happens in our lives isn't isn't um isn't that great you know we might not like where we are we might not like you know our lack of money we might not like who's in power um so you know one thing we have got is our imagination um, and we can think about lives in different ways the, the challenge then is is to go from you know how do we move on from it being you know um a story to something that is like you know a powerful kind of like narrative that can bring us together um and, and lead to action um so that's the kind of thing that i'm i'm really interested in um i guess the other thing is you, you know you mentioned um you know like you know, genuine opportunities you know you don't um you know don't, don't shape your engagement with people and um, what tends to happen um, is that researchers develop a practice and so it might be you know using cameras it might be using drama and, and usually these people are quite good at you know photography or they're quite good at you know drama um, or theatre or whatever and I guess with me I'm I don't really have any special skills you know I, I don't you know I'm not I don't I'm not an artist you know I'm willing to have a go at most things and I think that's the kind of thing that you know my, most of my work revolves around is just having a go so can I just ask um, the amount of emphasis that you do put on co-production and working with people to get to kind of get a sense of, of understanding of them is that something that evolved over time or is it something that you came in as a researcher and sought out to develop or is it that it was connected to a particular experience or there's um there's a thing in, 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 in you know in research it's called you know the critique of critique and lots of academics are trained up to say that doesn't work or this doesn't work or you know I, I can critique this and you know there's endless sort of um, criticisms of you know for example you know, leadership and collaboration the kind of things that I was working in you say oh it's a, it's a form of, you know ideology or it's related to neoliberalism it's related to managerialism and all these things I, I just looked around and I thought you know I, I had lots of colleagues who could do it as well or better than me and I thought we don't just need another person um you know saying it's all wrong it's not working um and so i thought what i can do is is, is is try to make things happen i think um and that's when really you get into kind of like how can you make things happen and i think again that's with you know you have to work with the people who are involved in the issue in, in the problem you have to kind of work together um and, and co-production really is an interesting way of thinking about that um there's you know hundreds of different ways of working with other people but co-production is this idea that you know government and funding agencies and and you know, people understand um it's the basic idea you know if 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 we how do we create something together you know if you go to the doctor they don't make you healthy you have to make yourself healthy as way well, as well um and then you can think of it like that and you can think of it in more kind of like you know um you know yeah in, in more you know kind of like persuasive ways like do you get to choose whether you have a doctor or do you get to kind of like do art therapy um, and so this is the way that people can kind of like have more say in reimagining, you know, their lives, really. Can you just tell us a little bit about your relationship with 42nd Street, which is a charity in central Manchester? Um, just a little bit about your background with them and how you've been collaborating with them over the last few years. Yeah, well, I, I was working on the Loneliness Connectors project. It was um, led by um, Janet Batsley, one of our colleagues um, in education. Um, and she's got a long running um, history with 42nd Street. I think she was the chief executive in the 80s, I think, or 80s or 90s. So going back a very long time. Um, and when when I was starting to work with her and 42nd Street, she was like, James, you know, this, this organization is really important to me. So you have to do well, you know. Um, but yeah, so 42nd Street is um, a, a children's and young people's mental health and well-being charity in uh, Manchester. It's a, it's a really impressive organization. Um, you know, you have to visit um, to, to understand that they, they work with a, a group of architects to you know, redesign the building. Um, and so when you go in, the walls are kind of lean across. And um, what they wanted to say is when people work, walk in for counseling, 
um, they, they felt like the walls were closing in on them. Um, and so they actually had the walls closing in on them. I don't know if that was the best way. <laughs> you might want it to be a bit more open. But you walk through this corridor and, you know, all the young people have um, written in, in chalk, you know, messages of hope to one another. And then you go and sit in the waiting area and there's lots of like nervous looking young people in there, you know, full of the troubles of the world. Um, and then you, you see these kind of like wardrobes on the, on the side of the wall and a, a counsellor will open the wardrobe door, you know, a bit like, um, you know, Narnia or whatever. And then they go into these little um, counselling suites hidden in the wall. So... I think it's a, it's a really wonderful place. Um, it's, um, you know, there's some great people there and they're really committed to arts and creative practice. Um, they, um, and a lot of youth organizations were cutting back due to austerity. Uh, they founded the Horsefall um, Gallery next door. Um, and so it's, you know, they understand that, you know, to get healthy often requires, um, you know, uh, you know, medicines, it requires antidepressants sometimes, but it also requires talking. But it also for a lot of young people involves, you know, doing art and, and creative tasks and coming together and doing things like youth social action that that can be just as in, you know, important and, you know, um, effective really in helping young people, you know, get well again. Yeah, I've been in 42nd Street as well. And I know what exactly what you're talking about with those wardrobes. I think it's just an amazing space for people to be in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, well, I think they've like like everyone really they've had to go online um so you know i think they've done really well to kind of like move um to online counseling and groups and things like that but yeah i mean it's an amazing space so just touching back on these projects then you're currently doing another one uh, with 42nd street which is called the left on red project which i think did that begin on the first of june or around that time this year 2020 yeah, so it's it's just started really. I think you know until we get the ethics through, we can't you know start you know properly. But yeah, so um, the Left on Red project um, follows on from the um, Loneliness Connexus project. So um, the Loneliness Connexus project really brought young people together, um, and through this carousel of methods or these creative methods, we kind of explored loneliness, um, and then you know we um, you know did the research really. We kind of created you know outputs. We created a, a theatre piece and things like that um the, uh, you know some funding came up um and so we did the left on red and it was going to be focused more on, on mental health which is you know an issue that we picked up on um, loneliness connects us but um you know we wanted to go into de you know, into more detail about that um between the, the application and getting the money however you know covid happened the lockdown happened and what we realized is that um a lot of the uh, methodology the way of working really um, focused on getting young people in a room you know we we went to the theater we we ate together went to the restaurant you know we had a nice night at Bundabust. Um we did all of these kind of like you know nice things but they all involved being in a room together and, and we thought you know uh, you know you're you know shielding so you know you couldn't be in the research and so what we thought we'd do is um, there are a lot of these things you know artistic and creative practices that young people and families had made as, as a response to the to lockdown you know from um, painting a rainbow in, in the window or you know, using a Lego rainbow or um, you know, there was paint with Grace and Perry and all these sorts of things. And we thought maybe um, there, there's something in that, that instead of inviting um, a group of young people to you know, come up to the horse fall and do something there, where we'd be asking them, what's it like at home? We thought, well, why don't we just base the inquiry in people's homes? Um, and so that's the kind of the idea. So instead of having um, you know, this, I don't know what you'd call it, like, you know, a workspace or a, a laboratory or, you know, kind of in, in, you know, in the city center, is there a kind of like way we could have like a home lab where we could kind of create a series of encounters for young people um, that they can, you know, host in, according to the, the, the rules of lockdown, but, you know, in the house, outside or, you know, um, online. Um, and that was it, you know, what are the, um, yeah, what can you do really? Because, um, you can't necessarily, like I, you know, if, if we take young people up to the horse fall, I can be in the room, I can kind of like see if they're on task, I can see if they understand, I can see if, you know, I can, I can learn from them, they can, you know, we can talk. If, if a young person's just sitting um, in their house and I ask them to do something and think about loneliness, uh, whether it makes them feel lonely, the, you know, there's a lot of, it, it, it's a different thing, you know, it could be quite risky, you know, talking about loneliness is like ethically, um, ethically, you know, risky or it's a sensitive issue you know it might open up some feelings we can't you know be there to kind of support them in that way so how are you planning on sort of capturing those 
emotions and feelings that the participants will be having during the study? Yeah, I mean, um, that, that is a good question. So um, at the moment, we don't actually know. I think well, we do know, but one of the things that we um, are trying not to do is the sort of um, the, the, the easy thing, you know, and I think this is what's happened, you know, when, when we went into lockdown, a lot of organisations put their kind of provision online and they asked people to kind of like, you know, write a poem, take a picture of it and you know, post it on Instagram or something. And that's fine. That's like a really good way of doing it. But it kind of um, that sets the boundaries of what you can know about that encounter. And it also becomes about, you know, pictures. Um, it becomes about, um, you know, words. And, and you know, often what we found in the, the loneliness research and lots of people have found elsewhere, it's, it's the things that people can't say that, that are really important. The, the things that in the loneliness project, we, you know, we'd talk sometimes for an hour with a group of young people. And it wasn't until the end of the hour, really, that they'd start talking about loneliness. Um, and so I think these are the kind of things that we're having to think about. The other thing that we wanted to think about really is that we didn't want, um, you know, uh, even as we're co-producing it with young people, we didn't want this kind of um, linear setting of tasks. So we didn't want to be a group saying, okay, everyone, um, you know, draw a picture, you know, do this, do that, because it feels a bit like busy work in a way. It's kind of like, you know, if you've got a nephew or niece and they're, they're irritating you, you, you say like, you know, oh, you know, colour something in. Um, so what we wanted to do is create ways of, you know, young people, you know, setting tasks, but also the young people that were kind of like doing the tasks will get to kind of like, you know, reinterpret what they've been asked to do um, and um, contribute in interesting ways. Um, and we've got a couple of examples that we're thinking through at the moment. And um, one is we're working with the City of Literature Festival um, in, in Manchester, or, or Great Manchester, maybe. Um, and they are going to commission um, a comics artist to do um, like an Afrofuturist comic. Um, and they'll, that'll be put online. And then we ask people to make, um, you know, contributions to that. Um, and, you know, the, the, the focus of the, the, the comic really will be, you know, how's your life changed? Um, and what would you like your life to be like when you go back? Um, and we think, you know, there'll be kind of like music, there might be, you know, comics, you know, you can make quite a decent comic now by just uh, taking pictures on your phone and just changing it with filters and things like that. Um, but we want to create a series of kind of these rounds where young people are saying, this is my life, but I'm not sure about this. And then that can be the focus of the comic. And then it becomes a kind of like way of, you know, young people thinking through their problems by you know, posting, reposting, writing, rewriting um, this comic. So essentially you're asking the participants to discuss their feelings in in an artistic way. That could be by contributing to a comic strip, but it could potentially be on things like TikTok or it could be in terms of videos, things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think we didn't want to say, um, yeah, we didn't want to provide like a box and say, fill the box really. You know, this is what we're telling you to do. Um, I think one of the, 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 the great things about working with young people is, yeah, they'll, they'll use, you know, technologies in, in really interesting ways. So um, we, one of the things that's nice about a comic really is um, it's just a series of boxes put together. So if you, if you put something on there, you know, someone else can put another box on. Um, and, you know, we, we can kind of like talk about our lives in really interesting ways, you know, I mean, I'm not really massively into to comics, but I remember reading one where um, like the, the hillside was a character or something. And it's just like, you know, that sort of thing where you think about, um, you know, when we think about loneliness, we think about people, but we could also think about nature. We can think about kind of like connections to bigger things. And I think that's like a really interesting way. So, you know, how do young people think about their lives and what kind of, you know, media and, and formats can they kind of like express themselves in? That's kind of a key part of it. So James, can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of the Left on Red project title, please? Yeah, okay, so um, I didn't actually know what this meant, but um, Left on Red is one of those, um, you know, like FOMO or fear of missing out. So I, I was asked, I put out um, a request on Twitter and I said, but well, this is what my project name is. And someone said, oh, you should call it Left on Red. And I was like, okay, that's amazing. Um, what does it mean? Um, and basically it's, um, when you send a message um, and someone's read it, but they don't get back to you. So you know that they've um, received it, they've read it, and they're not getting back to you. And I think that's the kind of the, the, the issue that young people 
um, face at the moment that social media makes everything visible, makes everything immediate. It intensifies our anxieties around, um, you know, connection. Did I say the right thing? Um, you know, like if you're asking someone out and, they, and, and it's left unread, you're like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. You know, I'm old enough that my, you know, my lack of popularity as a young person happened in, in private spaces and not in public. Um, and now if you're unpopular, you have all these, um, you know, um, windows into your life that you feel like you need to fill with activity. You, you need to go on, you know, the kind of like Everest base camp. You need to have loads of friends. You need to go um, and do things like that. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we spoke to, to young people in the loneliness connects us and, you know, they'd go out um, and, you know, they'd take pictures of themselves, you know, they'd go to a bar, take a picture of themselves with loads of, you know, beers or, you know, on the table, and then they'd head home or, you know, the, the, you know, a young woman was kind of, you know, imagined as, you know, getting ready, um, putting loads of makeup on, but not having anywhere to go and, and taking pictures when she's made up, you know? So I think these are the kind of things that we're interested um, with, you know, social media. And I, I think, I guess the one thing to say is, you know, there is this idea in the media that social media causes um, loneliness, you know, Young people now are lonely. What's different about young people now? What's different about youth or society? It's social media. We know we can blame, you know, something that's, that's relatively new. Um, the, the same thing happened with the, the landline telephone. So, you know, before the landline, you know, when the landline telephone came along, um, whenever it was, I, I shouldn't remember this, but like, I don't know, the 1800s or something, you know, people said it's the end of friendship. Why will people ever meet, you know? And then some people thought, well, actually, you know, um, it could be useful for lonely people. And we have the same kind of reactions to technologies, you know, um, you know, the landline telephone, the, the, the smartphone, social media. Um, so we wanted to get away from these like deterministic and kind of like fearful approaches that this social media, Facebook causes loneliness. Um, you know, often when, when you speak to young people, they've got much more nuanced um, ways of thinking about it. They think about, um, you know, there are healthier and unhealthier ways of, of using um, social media and uh, you're meant to use social media but you're not meant to embarrass yourself on it um, and what we find is you know if, if young people are unhappy with their lives they're not getting a lot of connection it is a way for them to kind of like you know fill that box in their life a little bit they they can reach out they can get some kind of like you know notifications but there are risks you know if you're using you know social media in an unhealthy way the more you're using it there's usually a kind of a correlation between you know kind of like depression and things like that so I think what we want to kind of like help young people into is, you know, healthier ways of using it. Um, but also understanding that it's not, um, you know, you can't just tell people not to, you know, have this feeling of fear of missing out. You know, the idea of FOMO is that everyone's having a nice life on a beach somewhere. Um, you know, you can't just say don't have FOMO because that creates another set of anxieties about, oh, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do this. So we need to think about, you know, more constructive ways of helping young people work and you know, use social media in healthier ways, I guess. You mentioned before about uh, children now talking about what they would want their lives to be like post lockdown. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's an opportunity for people to kind of stop and reflect on how um, like society was operating before the lockdown came into effect? And and in particular look at social media and how that impacts on on younger people and their sense of loneliness um yeah i think one thing that we have to think about when we're talking about lockdown is it creates this kind of like um i don't know what you call it like a, a narrative coherence like it's almost like where were you when jfk died where were you when princess diana died you know and, and these ideas, you know, with lockdown, we're all meant to be locked down, although, you know, people aren't locked down and people, some people are breaking it, some people are not. But, you know, for some people, it, it's been quite um, a nice time, I think. You know, there's been lots of, you know, if, if you've got a home, if you've got a garden, if you've got people to live with, it's actually quite nice. Um, you know, I imagine, you know, I, I've got lots of, you know, f f uh, friends, families, and they're all spending more time together. Um, the, the young people um, aren't as bothered because there doesn't seem to be anything to go out to. You know, so it was kind of like this nice sort of like, you know, what was life like in the 1970s? You were all getting, you know, living around a candle or something. And, and it's kind of like back to basics. But for some people, you know, life will have continued on. It'll be, it'll be harder. There'll be stresses. The parents will go out. Um, you know, there'll be concerns whether, the, you know, you know, people, you know, essential workers are bringing back, you know, COVID and things like that. So I think 
we have to remember there's like huge differentials in this. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's always important to, you know, not talk about what you don't really know at the moment. And I don't know how young people are using social media at the moment. You know, I'm, you know, we, there are studies that are happening, um, but it will be different. And I think that's one of the things that we look, we found in the, the loneliness connexus project. It's not as much, you know, the technology or it's not as much the kind of, um, it's the loneliness is part of our experience and it, you know, we have to think about the social conditions um, and the social conditions of loneliness usually relate to things like, you know, poverty, inequality, precarity, but this will be, you know, an extra set of traumas around fears and anxieties. So we don't know. I think this is it. And I think what we're trying to do in the, the left on red project is in a small way, create a set of resources for people to think about their, how their, you know, how their lives are, what they'd like to go back to. And then really it's a case of, you know, working with, you know, decision makers, funders to see if we can, you know, again, in a small way, make some of that possible. So, James, if you had sort of a vision or an optimum vision for the future in terms of your subject area around tackling youth loneliness and mental health, what would that look like for you? What, what are the things that you're ultimately trying to achieve that's a big question i think one of the things that um we were um looking for in the loneliness research is a new way of thinking about young people um and their lives and i think one of the things that happened with the loneliness you know agenda when it came out it was um uh what was it you know there's a, an epidemic of, of loneliness there's a crisis of our young people and what we find is no generation likes the young people that follow them you know apart from maybe you know the golden generation who went off to fight a war if you fight a war you'll get respect from your elders if not you don't no one likes them like going back to the greeks you know what i mean there's just like you know why won't cicero's child do these homework or something so you know what we need really is a, is a way of thinking about how it's hard to be young at the moment but it isn't necessarily um, a crisis or an epidemic because the thing that happens with crises and epidemics is another one comes along you know at the you know at one point um the, the children are too fat and then they're too thin they're depressed um they're not doing work they're knifing each other um and i think what we do is we focus on a specific thing and it's and it's a way really of creating inaction and inertia because you know we'll throw some money at say youth loneliness um but then, you know, the, the issue passes and we're, we're on to something else. And everyone, you know, in, in research and in, 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 you know, in charities, we all reposition and we say, oh, yes, I'm, you know, I'm very interested in life crime or something now. And, and that sounds a bit cynical and instrumental, but it's about, you know, following the conversation in a way. But I think what we need is to, is to think about young people's lives in, in again, in these, these ways are kind of always captured, but, you know, um, in, in a more kind of like holistic way. Um, we, we can't, it's important that we don't think about their problems as problems. Um, we don't individualize them with them. Um, one of the things I think we should do is, you know, there should be more access to kind of, you know, meaningful politics. There should be more act access to other arts and creativity. Um, you know, arts and creativity have been cut from the curriculum. Um, you know, it, we, we, need, we need engineers, we need scientists, we need mathematicians and all these kind of things. And we, we never do very well in that in this country for a lot of people so a lot of young people end up thinking they're stupid um they get depressed um and you know they end up going to kind of places like 42nd street which is a bit of a refuge um and so some of them get access to arts and creativity um i think for me it would be about saying you know arts and creativity are, are crucial to who we are and we need you know less stress we need less kind of performance accountability we need less exams um, and we need to kind of like fundamentally change how we think about young people's lives. But it, it's always incredibly difficult because, you know, if, if you say we shouldn't focus so much on exams, then people will come back and say exams are incredibly important. You have like um, a, a poverty of aspiration for young people. So I guess it kind of puts in perspective why, again, coming back to your motivations on why you're doing this, like that sort of world that you're trying to create. Um, I just wanted to move on to ask you for any of the postgraduate or prospective postgraduate students that might be watching this video or this podcast. Um, what advice would you give to them going into potentially becoming a prospective, uh, becoming a PT student at Manchester Met? What advice would you give them? I think what I'd say is, you know, we've all gone through this, this big experience. And I think if anything, it, 
you know, it, it's, it's a time to think about what you, what, what we care about, what we want our lives to be about. I think, you know, um, yeah, there was a moment, I think when I was just, yeah, work's not that important. Let's not think about work. And I think now we, we're coming back to think about like, you know, what do we want our lives like, you know, what do we want to do um, and what's important for our communities. And I think, um, I, I mean, I'm, you know, always, you know, studied basically, I think. So that's always been a big part of my life. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's an enjoyable way of, of, of engaging them with the world. I think what I would think about is, you know, what is going to be happening over the next year or two, you know, we're probably going to have um, a recession and the, the world's going to be in a bit of a mess. So, you know, why not take time really to go and, you know, um, read about the world and think about changing it. Um, I think if you, if you were going to apply, I think what I'd do is um, make sure that you kind of like complement your study by thinking about, you know, working with organizations like 42nd Street, there's lots of opportunities in Manchester to volunteer, lots of opportunities to engage in activism. I think it's important, you know, we, we ask, you know, what are, what are master's courses, you know, how are they kind of, you know, I mean, I've got two masters, you know, you don't need two masters, you know, what we had a kind of like, you know, collecting qualifications. I think now we need to really think about, um, yeah, what is the purpose of, of studying together? What is the purpose of the conversations that we're having in, in, in a room? Um, why are we doing this? Um, and I think if you've got, you know, a, a good, you know, good answer to each of those, or you're, you're curious to find out, I think, yeah, uh, yeah, apply. That'd be um, my advice. Do you, do you teach in any courses or are you supervisor in any, for any PhD students at all, James? Um, yeah, so I teach on some of the um, undergraduate and then the MA and then I've got some PhD students as well. So would you say that your research that you've done, does that influence your teaching at all or the way that you provide learning experiences for other people? Yeah, I think um, my research does inform my uh, teaching. Uh, I mostly teach actually on um, the, 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 you know, the leadership and management courses. So I don't, I'm not as close to doing research on that. And at the moment, you know, um, I've taken a bit of a break from it. But I think one of the things that I, I do try to bring from my research is that um, it's important to be creative and inventive, you know, with the methods you use. Um, there's lots of sort of, um, you know, games we play um, thinking about, um, you know, leadership practice. One of the things with leadership is, you know, you have this idea there's, there's an individual um, and they have, you know, better qualities or virtues or, you know, ideas than everyone else. And they try out and they have a vision and a mission and they go and attempt to realize it. And, and what happens is everyone else thinks it's rubbish and it doesn't happen or, or something like that. And so it's about, about negotiation. So there are lots of kind of, um, uh, you know, techniques about playing like games with cards that, you know, pr pr provide a series of you know, prompts and, you know, um, challenges really to think about your um, ideas collectively. And I think that's the kind of thing that I really like to do in the, the leadership course really is say, um, everyone is encouraged to be a leader. Um, and, and that's fine, you know, but one of the things that we need to think about is just, you know, what does it mean to do things collectively? And leadership might be part of that, but a lot of it is going to be about, you know, cooperation. Um, and, and that might challenge in a way, you know, ideas of leadership. Um, and, you know, this is what I'm kind of interested in, you know, in our society, we, 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 we're always thinking about, you know, who's going to save us, you know, will it be Dominic Cummings? Is Dominic Cummings a bad man or a good man? You know, you know, all of these things get wrapped up in these kind of like powerful, great white men or women. Um, and, I, you know, what I think it's important for us to do is to challenge those ideas. Um, and I think, you know, we can, people come onto a course about leadership and management and they expect it to give them the skills, um, to you know help them succeed um and i think one of the things i found in my research is that leadership is kind of a bias you know it's a kind of a way of looking at the world that can kind of like you know um you know encourage you not to see the situation in the way that it might be it might you know um, leadership encourages us to see the world in terms of um, motivating employees and those employees having a vision um, and, and and for us to supply it but often you know, what people don't need is a vision or motivation. They haven't the motivation. They don't know, you know, they haven't got the time to do their jobs. And so leadership can kind of become this distraction at the side of things um, to stop people doing actually what they're trying to do. Um, and I think it's hard to kind of get that across to people because they think that leadership is this really important thing because, you know, we all watch films where Will Smith saves the day or we, we learn about history where Margaret Thatcher was really important. But really what we need to think about is kind of like these more collective processes. Um, and I think that's, you know, something that you can do 
through games, through playful activities, through simulations and scenarios. And I think that's what my research really brings into it. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it every week. Let's have a, a, a week <laughs> every Tuesday. Lovely to speak to you both. Take care. Yes. Thanks, James.